Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan. I'd like to talk to you today about Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique with a particular focus on the structure of each of the five movements. The origins of this groundbreaking and justly famous orchestral piece of music are well known. Berlioz, after seeing a performance of Hamlet in Paris in 1827, had fallen in love with the actress playing Ophelia, Harriet Smithson. And um, despite his best efforts to get her attention after this, she was not interested. So Berlioz poured out his unrequited love uh, into the composition of this symphony in 1830. It was premiered in the December of that year at the Paris Conservatoire. And funnily enough, Harriet Smithson, the Irish actress who we had fallen in love with, she did actually hear of this piece and she came um, to hear it performed. She met Berlioz and they did actually marry eventually, although the marriage was less than successful. The Symphonie Fantastique is Romanticism par excellence. Berlioz is not so much concerned with abstract forms uh, in this music um, or, an, or a symphonic argument. Any forms he does use, including sonata form, are there really to serve the purpose of telling a story, expressing images, ideas, feelings, emotions. He also helpfully provides a programme. He writes, a young musician of unhealthily sensitive nature and endowed with vivid imagination has poisoned himself with opium in a paroxysm of lovesick despair. The narcotic dose he had taken was too weak to cause death, but it has thrown him into a long sleep accompanied by the most extraordinary visions. In this condition, his sensations, feelings and memories find utterance in his sick brain in the form of musical imagery. Even the beloved one takes the form of melody in his mind, like a fixed idea that is ever returning, that he hears everywhere. And that fixed idea, which we hear throughout the symphony, that E day fix, goes like this. heard throughout the work in various guises um, and on different instruments, different combinations of instruments, um, expressing different moods and emotions depending on the context in which it's heard in. The symphony opens with a movement which Berlioz called Visions Passions. And he writes for this first movement. At first, the young musician thinks of the uneasy and nervous condition of his mind, of some belongings, of depression and joy isolation without recognisable cause. All that he had experienced before the beloved one appeared to him. Then he remembers the ardent love with which she suddenly inspired him. He thinks of his almost insane anxiety of mind and his raging jealousy, of his reawakening love, of his religious consolation. This first movement really is uh, a sonata form movement, actually. But you get the sense that Berlioz is really just paying lip service to this musical structure. I say that because the introduction and the coda to this movement are just densely packed with um, contrasting musical material. Such an, suddenly flits from one idea to another, perhaps expressing the artist's mind as he goes through his various um, hallucinations. The movement begins like um, a parting of curtains onto this fantastical um, and hallucinogenic um, 
state of mind. We have this rather beautiful soft opening like this. Introduction is varied. We have many ideas in this lengthy introduction. Um, we eventually get to a transition passage which brings us to the exposition. And the first subject is the E Day Fix, which I played to you just a moment ago. We have a transition again, and we have this new rather um, this ardent idea, isn't it? Is. So listen out for that. We have a repeated exposition. Then we have a concentrated and short development. Listen out for this rising and um, descending chromatic scale. Then we have the recapitulation, which is slightly varied. We have the first subject, we have this new transition, always like this. And so forth, I like that bit. We then have a very short restatement of the second subject, Blink and You Miss It. We then have the coda, and the coda, like the introduction, is made up of various contrasting ideas. Uh, you very much get the sense that Berlioz's heart is in the introduction and coda of this movement. Um, the coda begins with this new idea. Oboes have this new yearning figure. We then have uh, a rather boisterous version of the E Day fix again, and we finally end with the passage where Berlioz describes a sense of religious consolation and of course in Western art music that idea of faith is um, usually summoned by a plagal cadence and that's what Berlioz employs here. We have this um extraordinary first movement. The second movement is a ball and uh, Berlioz just very uh, just writes a sentence on this. In a ballroom amidst the confusion of a brilliant festival he finds the loved one again. It's essentially a ternary form movement, ABA. -A. We have a brief introduction setting the scene then we have this rather elegant and graceful melody played on the first violins. And that plays on 
one. It's a lovely melody. But that's accompanied by this phrase as well. Out, listen out for the harp and glissandi throughout that section. Then we get to the B section, the trio if you like, which is a waltz version of the E day fix, uh, that melody we were first introduced to in the first subject. And this time it sounds like this. We have a return to A, that lovely melody on the violins, and we have a rather boisterous coda with a brief return to the E day fix, as if the artist has seen his beloved at the end of the ballroom. That ends with a rather exhilarating uh, final few bars. The third movement is very much inspired by Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. The pastoral. That symphony, of course, is famous because Beethoven conjures up conjures up the sights and sounds of um, of the countryside, and this is what Berlioz does here in this movement. He writes, "It is a summer evening. He is in the countryside musing when he hears two young shepherds playing the Rans de Vache in alternation." This is the tune used by the Swiss to call their flocks together. This shepherd duet, the surroundings, the soft whisperings of trees stirred by the zephyrs, some prospects of hope recently made known to him. All these sensations unite to impart a long unknown repose to his heart and to lend a smiling colour to his imagination. And then she appears once more. His heart stops beating, painful forebodings fill his soul. Should she prove false to him? One of the shepherds resumes the melody, but the other answers him no more. Sunset, distance rolling of thunder, loneliness, silence. This movement begins with an extended introduction, and this is the this conjures up those two shepherds calling to each other. First shepherd is played on the cor anglais, the second um, on an off-stage oboe, and I saw this performed at the Royal Albert Hall recently in the proms, and I believe the oboist was right at the top in the gallery. It's a very evocative moment in the concert, hearing this space between these two shepherds. So the melody goes like this. <laughs> and eventually their two lines kind of join together in this rather sinuous way. Uh, it's a very beautiful opening to the movement. Eventually we get to this, the main idea of this movement, which I'm going to call um, A. Um, and it goes like this, it's beautiful.
goes on. Eventually we get to a B section, a different section, which starts in the same key actually, although it soon modulates. A bit more forceful, it's like this. Carrying on this section, we have um, this idea. That kind of sense of yearning, that rocking motif. Uh, we have a, re a return to A, this time varied, a return to B, varied again, shorter. Then we have the central part of the movement, the C section, which is the E day fix again, the, another version of the E day fix. Uh, and it gets very kind of stormy and passionate here. Um, this is where the, the artist is thinking, you know, is she going to be faithful to me, my beloved? Um, and there's a bit which reminds me more perhaps of Beethoven's fifth, Beethoven's fifth than Beethoven's uh, sixth. We hear this kind of build up of diminished uh, seventh intervals and uh, we get into this climax which reminds me of a uh, part of the first movement of Beethoven's fifth. Eventually that dies down. We have a variation of A again on the clarinets this time and then we have a proper and then Berlioz treats us to a section where he combines all the melodies we've heard um, very cleverly so we have the that a the beautiful flowing a melody the, the slightly more impassioned b melody and the e day fix all combined in one section then we have the coda and the coda we have four timpanists evoking uh, thunder, which of course is very reminiscent of uh, Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. Um, we have the shepherd again, and it's uh, a very calm and otherworldly ending to this beautiful movement. Then we go to the fourth movement. The fourth movement, we're back to sinister territory here, and this is called the procession to the scaffold. Berlioz writes, he dreams that he had murdered his beloved and he has been condemned to death and is being led to the scaffold, a march that is alternately sombre and wild, brilliant and solemn, accompanies the procession. Tumultuous outbursts are followed without modulation by measured steps. At last the fixed idea returns, for a moment a last thought of love is revived, then all is cut short by the death blow. This movement is, incredi is incredible fun really, it's uh, a really stirring piece of music as well. Essentially it's an alternation between two ideas. We have this idea full of kind of foreboding. come on to the, the main march melody which goes like this um, really kind of gets you going that melody we have a repeat of A very short this time we have B we have A2 which takes us to a climax this time and then we're into the coda we have this chugging idea and then as he's on about to be beheaded on the guillotine we hear the e day fix again um, his last moment of hearing his beloved and then the blade comes down and in a stroke of orchestral genius, Berlioz 
evokes through sound the head coming off the block and bouncing down. It's really very clever the way he does it. Rather macabre, but very clever. I mean, this piece really does show the full gamut of uh, Berlioz's genius in orchestration. It really does, the whole symphony. And this can be said, of course, for the final movement, the finale, um, which is called The Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. And this is the description. He dreams that he is present at a witch's dance, surrounded by horrible spirits, amid sorcerers and monsters in many fearful forms, who have come to attend his funeral. Strange sounds, groans, shrill laughter, distant yells that other cries seem to answer. The beloved melody is heard again, but has its noble and shy character no longer. It has become a vulgar, trivial and grotesque kind of dance. She, it is, who comes to attend the witch's meeting. Friendly howls and shouts greet her arrival. She joins the infernal orgy. Bells toll for the dead. A burlesque parody of the Dies Irae. The witches round dance. The dance and the Dies Irae are heard at the same time. This movement begins in such an extraordinary way. We have these oddly spaced string chords. I believe the string section is divided into eight. We have these ominous um, kind of sli ascending slides or glissandes in the bass. It is such a remarkable piece of tone painting in music. Um, I remember performing this piece with a youth orchestra and the conductor Peter Stark said, it's incredible to imagine that this was composed six years after Beethoven's Ninth. And it is, it's worlds apart from that sound world. It's really quite incredible, revolutionary. This movement, again, a bit like the first movement, can be organized using sonata form principles. But again, it's not, that's not really the point of it, although it's, I, I believe it's useful to follow the music um, as you listen to it, so I will go along that route. We have an extended introduction. We hear the E day fix played again, but this time in a very mocking way on an E flat clarinet. We suddenly hear bells, and we hear like these anticipations of this dance, which is going to become so central to this movement. And eventually, we hear the Dies Irae, that ancient melody about the Day of Wrath, used in the, um, the Latin Requiem Mass. And here we have the main Dies Irae melody, played low down in the bass with the bells in the background. first subject, that, that DSEA, I like to call it first subject. We have a transition which anticipates the second subject, which is the witch's round dance, which goes like this. <laughs> Treats this fugally, so he builds up a fugue based on this uh, this rather sinister dance. It's really quite extraordinary, actually. He does. Do we call this the second? We can call this the second subject. Then we have a development section where he combines this deep dies irae, boom, 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 with a kind of a ghostly version of the witch's round dance. Then Berlioz has this amazing stroke of genius. We have the recapitulation, and instead of playing first subject with second subject, he combines them at the same time. A real masterstroke at this point. 
We hear the Dies Irae blaring out and the witches round dance at the same time. An incredible moment. Then we think the movement will finish, but the music kind of collapses again into another development section and we hear this kind of variation on the uh, round dance and the strings play colenio here. Uh, that means when they hit the bows, it's like this. Um, oh, it's E flat, I think, isn't it? So you're kind of hitting the hair and the wood at the same time with that repeated rhythm uh, while the round dance comes up. We eventually hear a version of the Dia Zero again and then we're into this riotous coda for this movement and the whole symphony and if you listen carefully you hear the shrieking of the um, the artist above in the high uh, woodwinds amongst this racket and the symphony closes in the most extraordinary way. Berlioz's Symphony Fantastic is a true masterwork and please have a look at the description below with the bar numbers to describe which describes the form of each of the movements in true depth. That's really why I do these videos um, to explain the structure of the music because I find with classical music it helps to know where you are in the music and hopefully uh, that will be of use to you. Thank you for listening and watching. If you have any further suggestions, um, any pieces you'd like me to analyse, please subscribe and put them in the comments below. Thank you. Bye-bye.